All right, I hate to interrupt, but it's the time. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I forgot. I forgot it. Switch the scene. Um, today, there will be a new chapter about the uh, chemical activity and reactions of uh, complexes. So I would like to start this chapter by a brief review of what actually drives the chemical reaction in general. So you probably know this from previous classes when we look at a chemical reaction in very general terms. What drives a chemical reaction? Yes. It's the transfer of the event of the balance electrons, like in the most simplest terms. The what? Yeah, it says the transfer of like uh, balance electrons. Like the, like the participation element, like if you just want to like do it with the simplest kind of terms. Yeah, I mean, it can, uh, it involves, the chemical reaction often involves electron yeah. and it can transfer in some form. But what is the driving force for a chemical reaction? What makes a chemical reaction actually happen? Well, what do you like energy? Like the, the you know, basis, it's like, you know, spontaneous or non-spontaneous, like the, you know, if it's going to like happen, you know, if you have like, you know, your double, your double dagger. Um, if it's spontaneous, non-spontaneous, if you're looking at the energetic standpoint. Yeah, so there must be a lot of energy force for yeah. the chemical reaction to happen. So, correct. Uh, so, that's the first. Uh, parameter to consider. So the thermodynamics and uh, reaction is thermodynamically favorable when delta G is, is negative. Okay? When delta G is, is, is zero, then nothing happens. And when delta G is positive, then the reverse reaction is actually favorable. Okay. Um, but there's a second um, parameter to consider. So a chemical reaction can be thermodynamically favorable, but nonetheless it can be that in practice, you do not observe any reaction. So what can be the reason for that? Can you repeat the question one more time? Sorry? Can you repeat the question one more time? When we have a thermodynamic drive for four reaction, but nonetheless do not observe every reaction, what can be the reason for this? Hold the activation energy is a bit too high. Correct. So when you have a very high activation energy to overcome, then the kinetics of the reaction can be very slow. And in fact, it can be so slow that we in practice do not observe the reaction. Okay. So basically, whether a reaction or not can be observed or not um, depends on well, the thermodynamics, but it also <clears throat> depends on the kinet kinetics. Okay. So now the thermodynamics is associated with this relative stability of the reactants and the products. When the products are more stable, the energies is 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 negative and the reaction will be will be observed. Um, so the rate of the reaction is associated with the um, activation um, energy and with the inertness and the liability of the complex. So when the complex is is inert, then we have to overcome a very high activation energy. And when the complex is labor, then we have to overcome um, uh, uh, very low activation energy in order to make the dative bonds, dative bonds cleave and make the reaction um, happen. All right. Um, so generally, when we have a labor complex, then we have fast ligand exchange because the bonds can be broken easily, but that can of course happen. Uh, reversible, reversibly, and when that bond breakage happens reversibly, then that means that we have a very fast exchange, 
Um, when we have an inert complex, then that means the opposite, and that means that we have a slow ligand exchange. Now, what does what does fast and slow mean quantitatively? Can we actually draw some kind of border in between the two cases? And the answer is yes, we can. Um, so we draw the uh, borderline approximately at a half lifetime for the bond to be um, approximately 30 seconds. So when a metal ligand bond has a half lifetime of smaller than 30 seconds, we say that the activation energy that needs to be overcome to make that bond breakage happen um, is, is low. And we say that we have a lava complex. An example for this is, for instance, um, the um, bond between iron and sulfur in the well, Kenta Aqua Thiocyan NATO Iron 2 Plus. Okay. Um, because the liability of the iron sulfur bond, we can um, exchange the ligand very fast okay, by, for instance, a, a fluoride um, ligand. So the uh, metal ligand bond in this case has a half lifetime of approximately one second in, or smaller than one second even. And therefore, the reaction happens very fast. The ligand substitution reaction happens very fast. Okay, therefore also the chemical equilibrium will be reached very fast. Okay, now um, when we have a half life time of larger than 30 seconds, and we say that's associated with a high activation energy. An example for this is the substitution of um, the amine ligand in the hexaamine cobalt 3 plus by water ligands, uh, aqua ligands in, in acid. So there is a thermodynamic driving force for that, but nonetheless, the hydrolysis reaction occurs only very slowly, and that's because the inertness of the cobalt nitrogen bond in this complex, which is, which is a half lifetime of larger than one day. So in this case, the chemical equilibrium will be reached only slowly. Okay, so now can we rationalize somehow um, which complexes are inert and which ones are liable? Can we predict this from the property of a, a metal and the property of a, of a ligand? And the answer is that there are some guidelines, some rules for that. So when we look at uh, D block metal ions, then the electron configuration um, gives us an idea whether we would expect a label or not complex. So for octahedral D3, low spin D4 to D6, and planar D8 um, complexes, we often observe that these complexes are inert. Um, in addition to that, when the period of the metal ion is higher, then more likely the complex is less liable. And thirdly, the higher the positive charge of the metal ion, the less liable the bonds. So you can explain the latter two trends, but when you consider that um, when we have a metal ion of a higher period, then that's a softer ion, and you know that when the ion is softer, it more likely makes a bond which has a more covalent character, and more covalent bonds tend to be more inert. And the same is actually the case when the positive charge of the metal ion is, is higher, then in order to stabilize that high positive charge, the associated bond uh, must be more covalent, and when it's more covalent, it tends to be it tends to be less less liable. Okay, um, 
So what about metal ions, which are not d block metal ions? So um, when we look at the other blocks, the S block ions are the most, most liable ones, followed by the F block, followed by the D block. So with regard to P, um, the inertness can vary a lot depending on the particular, particular circumstances. Um, so um, P block elements can make very inert complexes, but they can also make very liable complexes, so have a very wide um, variability. You now, when we look at the ligand, um, generally when there is a ligand that is a good leaving group, then more likely the bond between the ligand and the metal is it's liable. When we don't have a good leaving group, then we have a greater inertness. You know this principle from organic chemistry, it just translates to coordination chemistry. As well as an organic chemistry, when your when uh, substituent is a good leaving group, then that reaction tends to happen faster. And in coordination chemistry, you have the same principle. When your ligand is a good leaving group, then it tends to uh, happen faster. So good leaving groups are usually groups that produce molecules or ions which are stable. Okay, so an example would be a, a, a chloral ligand okay, that produces a chloride ion to a stable species. Whereas when you have, for instance, a methyl group as a ligand, if you cleave the a metal ligand bond, it would produce either a methyl radical or uh, a CH3 minus anion, which would not be uh, so stable as an isolated species. Okay, now let us go from the um, kinetics to the thermodynamics. What determines the st stability of complex? And a lot of that can be derived from a comp uh, concept that we looked at previously, and that's the hard and soft acid and base, uh, base concept. Um, before we go to that, however, um, something more general. Um, so the delta G is certainly related to the um, equilibrium constant. So we have when we have a negative delta G, we have a large equilibrium constant, which says that our products lie actually on the right side. And there's of course a relationship between delta G and K, which is given by this equation here, which says that delta G is equal to minus RT times delta K. You probably remember uh, that equation from your first year and your physical chemistry. Physical chemistry classes. So when you have a reaction which forms a metal ligand bond, M plus L is ML, and there's a uh, negative. Delta G, then the equilibrium constant is being given by this equation here, the concentration of the product over the product of the, of the concentrations of the reactants to the to the correct powers. So when um, in chemical equilibrium, when delta G is equal to zero, well, our concentration of well, ML is large and the concentration of M and L is small, and that means that the equilibrium lies far on the right side. Okay, so K is usually reported as log K because K can vary over 35 orders of magnitude. So, in order to avoid to work with a lot of exponential terms, we, run off, we more often use the log K, which gives us more handy numbers. All right. But now, actually, what I mentioned to what I mentioned previously, uh, what determines the stability of a complex? So a lot of that can be derived from the hard and soft as in base um, theory. So we've learned that when we have hard hard interactions, that gives a strong bond. When we have soft soft interaction, it gives a strong bond. But when we have hard soft interaction, that gives 
a weak bond. And the bond stability then greatly influences the overall thermodynamic stability of a, of a, of a, of a complex. Okay, so here's an example for silver plus complexes. And you see here the log K values for silver complexes having variable ligands, uh, amine ligands, flu ligands, chlor chloro ligands, and bromo ligands, respectively. So you see that the log K value for any tree is 3.3. For F minus, it's minus 0 0.17. For the chloroligan, it's 3.08. And for the bromoligan, it's 4.30. So that would argue that silver makes the most stable complexes with the bromoligan and the least stable complexes with fluoligan. So can we explain that? We can explain this with a hard and soft as a base concept, considering that silver plus is a soft ion. So it would make the strongest interaction with the softest ligand. So the softest ligand in that series is the bromo ligand. And we see that the bromo ligand indeed produces the largest uh, uh, constant of formation value of 4.3. So the hardest ligand in that series would be the fluoro ligand with a value of uh, minus 0.17. Um, and that confirms that the hardened ligand produces the, the weakest complex, the smallest con uh, uh, constant, constant of formation. So see here, just by this example, that very qualitative considerations can fairly accurately predict the stability of complexes. All right, so silver plus is soft, bromide is the softest one, so therefore the greatest stability. Um, the fluoride is the hardest one, therefore the smallest stability. Okay, uh, now let us move from complexes that only have a single ligand to multi ligand complexes. How do the constants of formation actually change as the metal picks up more ligands? So let us, for instance, consider a complex that has four ligands. So in the first step, our metal ion would pick up the first ligand would use a complex ML. So that would be associated with a constant information, which would be given by the equation, well, ML over M times R. So the concentration of ML over the concentration of M times the concentration of R. Okay. Now, this species here could pick up another ligand to make a species ML2. So that would be another reaction associated with an equilibrium constant. And that equilibrium constant would be given by the concentration of ML2 over the concentration of ML times L. So now this species here could pick up the next ligand to make a species ML3. And its equilibrium constant would then be determined by the concentration of ML3 over the concentration of ML2 times the concentration of R. Last but not least, this species, ML3, could pick up a fourth ligand to make a species ML4. And that one would then be associated with another equilibrium constant, which would be given by the concentration of ML4 over the concentration of ML3 times R. All right, so now um, we could ask, well, which of these equilibrium constants would be the greatest and which one would be the smallest? What would be the relative values of K1 
2k2, 2k3, 2k4. Would there be a general trend? And the answer is, yes, there is one. So the k values decline from k1 to k2 to k3 to k4. So now we can think about, well, what could be an explanation for this? Can you maybe think about an explanation? Probably have heard that in other classes before. Virtual students are also invited to make suggestions. No one? Well, the answer is, it's a statistical effect. So as the metal picks up ligands, the number of the free ligands in solution declines. Okay? And as that concentration declines, the probability that the complex can pick up another ligand declines. Okay? So for that reason, um, the value of the equilibrium constants declined, okay? So for general conflicts MLN, then exactly the same uh, principle holds. K1 is larger than K2, is larger than K3, is larger than Kn, all right? So this can be explained statistically. So the number of available free ligands decreases with a number n, and therefore the probability that another metal ligand bond forms declines. All right. So the overall stability constant is always given by the product of the individual constants. So k overall is equal to k one to k times K2, times K3, times K4, or for general complex MLN, the overall equilibrium constant is given by K1 times K2, uh, times K3, times Kn. Okay, however, these um, considerations are only a rule, there are exceptions to that, rule and whenever, whenever we find an exception to that rule then that means that there's a major change in the electronic structure of the complex okay so here is um, one example so for instance we can start out with an hexa aqua iron to plus complex and substitute two of the aqua ligands by a bipyridal ligand, okay? Then the bipyridal ligand replaces two of the aqua ligands and we have two free water molecules on the right hand side of the equation. So now there's an equilibrium constant associated with this and the log Kf value in this case is 4.2. So then we can substitute another two uh, aqua ligands by another bipyridal ligand. Now our product complex has two aqua ligands and two bipyridal ligands, and we have produced another two water molecules. Okay? So now, according to what we have learned, the log Kf value of this reaction should be smaller than the previous log Kf value. And we find that this is indeed the case. This second one is only 3.7 in comparison to the first one, which was 4.2. So now we can also substitute the last two 
water molecules by a third bipyridyl, and we form now a well, Swiss bipyridyl iron two plus, still another two water molecules. And according to what we have learned, now the log k value should be even smaller, it should be smaller than 3.7. However, this is not what we observe. We observe an, an astonishingly large log k value of 9.3. And that indicates that upon the substitution of the last pair of acrolygans, there must have been a major change in the electronic structure. So now in this case, this is the switch from a high spin complex uh, to a low spin complex. Okay, so the bipolar ligands produce a, a larger delta O. Okay, so the delta O increases as we add the first bipolar ligand, increases further as we add the second one, but only if we add the third one, our delta O is larger enough so that our complex switches from high spin to low spin. Okay, and now we have a significantly different electronic structure which can be associated with uh, unusually high equilibrium constant. Okay. All right, so here's just the second example. So here we have a hexa aqua mercury to plus, and we can again substitute the aqua ligands by chloroligands. So we can do a first substitution. Then we have five aqua ligands left and have now one chloroligand attached to the mercury, producing one aqua ligand here. And that reaction is associated with a log K value of 6.74. So now we can substitute a second aqua ligand. So then we have four aqua ligands left and have two chloral ligands in our product. So that is associated now with a log K value of 6.48. And that's in accordance with expectations. So the second log K value is smaller than the first log K value. So now, as we substitute uh, another uh, water molecule by another chloral ligand, we have a change of, of coordination number. Okay, So as we add another chloral ligand, our complex changes from the coordination number six to the coordination number four. You see that in the product complex, now we have only one aqua ligand and three chlor ligands. So this reaction has a log k value of 0 0.85. So this is, as we would expect, smaller than the log kf2 value. However, it's much smaller. It's actually so much smaller um, so that it cannot be explained anymore by statistical effects. Again, the change in electronic structure sees explanation in this case the change from the coordination number six to the coordination number four is the explanation. All right. So now let's go to the stability of uh, so-called chelate complexes. So chelate complexes have an unusually high stability. Um, and that can be explained by thermodynamic factors as well as kinetic factors. So look, let's look first at the thermodynamic uh, factors, also called the thermodynamic chelate effect. So the thermodynamic chelate effect is an entropy effect. Okay. Um, so we have an increase in entropy when two or more monodentate ligands are replaced by chelate ligands. So for instance, um, here we have a hexaamine nickel two plus, and we can substitute all the amine ligands by ethyl and diamine ligands. So that produces us six amine ligands. So now we can compare the number 
of species on the left side of the equation and the right side of the equation. And we see on the left side of the equation, we have four, and on the right side of the equation, we have seven. So the more species that we have, the higher the uh, entropy, because there are more possibility how to arrange the uh, species within the system. So in this case, our entropy increase is plus 88 joules per Kelvin and more. Okay. So the cell dynamic chelate effect is an entropic effect that results um, because we're creating more species um, when we substitute monodentitics by multidentitics. Okay, so now in addition to that, we also have a kinetic chelate effect. And um, that occurs for um, for for two reasons. So the first reason is that the cleavage of the first metal ligand bond is slower because the ligand has to rotate and bend in order to make the metal ligand bond cleave. So for that reason, this step here is slow, okay? Now the second effect is that, well, after the first metal ligand bond is cleaved, um, the ligand is still attached by the second point of attachment. Therefore, the, the donor atom here um, still needs to stay in close proximity <coughs> to the metal until the second bond is being cleaved. And that gives rise to an increased probability for the reverse reaction. Okay, and that increased probability, of course, slows down the second bond cleavage. Okay, so therefore the second step is also slow. And overall, therefore, we have a much lower rate of reaction. Okay, um, now let us have a closer look at the mechanism. We have now discussed the inertness and the kinetics and the uh, thermodynamic stability. Now let us more closely look at what mechanisms, according to which mechanisms, a ligand substitution reaction can occur. Okay, so there's a mechanism which is called the intimate mechanism. And there's a mechanism which is called the stoic, a stoichiometric mechanism. So what is the difference between these two? So the intermediate intimate mechanism goes through a transition state as we substitute one ligand by another. Okay, but in a stoichiometric mechanism, we have an intermediate. Okay, that means that we go through a local thermodynamic minimum on the reaction coordinate. Okay, so now um, these reactions occur according to the principle of microscopic reversibility. That just means that the reverse reaction follows the same reaction path than the forward reaction. All right, so the free energy of the reaction is just being being given by the energy difference, free energy difference between the products and the reactants. Okay, whereas the activation energy is the, the energy difference between the uh, reactants and the transition state for the intimate mechanism and the, well, energy difference between the reactants and the energy maximum 
which is also kind of an, a transition state in between the reactants and the local intermediate. Okay. All right. Um, let us look closer at this stoichiometric mechanism. There are two ways this stoichiometric mechanism can be realized. Um, it can be realized either as a so-called dissociative mechanism, um, labeled D, or a so-called associative mechanism, um, A. Okay. When we have a dissociative mechanism, then our intermediate here on the reaction coordinate has a lower coordination number. When we have an associative mechanism, then our intermediate has a higher coordination number. That means that in the associative mechanism, we first add a ligand to the reactant to make a species with a higher coordination number. And then in the second step, the old ligand is being lost, okay, and we're finally going to the product. Yes, in, in the dissociative mechanism, first a metal ligand bond cleaves, producing a species with a lower coordination number, and then the second step, the new ligand comes in and forms a new metal ligand bond. Okay, so now, however, we talk only about a dissociative mechanism and an associative mechanism, when the respective intermediates can actually be detected by an experimental technique. So this is not always, always, the, always the case because these um, local minima can be very shallow. And then the concentration of the intermediate is so small so that it cannot be detected with an uh, experimental technique. In this case, we then talk about a so-called interchange mechanism I, and depending on whether it's associative, we call it I subscript A or dissociate uh, or dissociative interchange I subscript D. Okay. So overall, we can have everything from A to I A to intimate to I D to D. And that's basically all the possibilities that there are. All right. So we can also ask, well, what is the rate limiting step for the associated and the dissociated mechanism respectively? So for the dissociative case, it's the dissociation of the old ligand, that is because in order to go into this local thermodynamic minimum here, we have to go strongly uphill, okay, and overcome a high activation barrier, whereas to go from here to here, we only have to overcome a very slow activation barrier. Therefore, the dissociation is the uh, rate limiting step. And for the associative mechanism, just the opposite is the case. We have to go strongly uphill in energy in order to produce that intermediate with a higher coordination number. It's only requiring us um, a little bit of, of activation energy in order to go from the species with a higher coordination number to the final product. All right, so now are there um, ways to distinguish between dissociative and ID and associative and AD? So um, because of what we just said, we can use the um, rate determining step in order to find that out. So if the re reaction rate is strongly dependent on the identity of the new ligand, then it's A or IA, okay? Just because 
Well, the association is the rate limiting step, so it will strongly depend on the identity of the new ligand because first the new ligand has been added to produce the intermediate. Um, if the reaction rate is not strongly dependent on the identity of the new ligand, then that's an indication for D um, or ID. So here's just an example. So here we substitute uh, a chloral ligand by a different ligand. So we can either substitute the chloral ligand here by an iodo ligand, or we can substitute the chloral ligand by a bromo ligand. Okay, so we find that the rate changes by a factor of 100 as we uh, change, change the ligand. So we would say that the reaction rate is strongly dependent on the identity of the new ligand. And for that reason, we would um, believe that our reaction mechanism is likely um, A or I. Okay. So um, the other factors that can determine well, whether we have rather D or rather A, the generally high coordination numbers and large steric crowding, they favor the dissociative mechanism. That's pretty, pretty obvious when the coordination number is high or when there is a lot of steric crowding, crowding then that increases the likelihood that a ligand first dissociates, producing an intermediate species with a lower coordination number. Um, if that's not the case, then the likelihood of a associative mechanism increases. So when we have low coordination numbers and little still crowding, the chance for an associative mechanism increases. All right, so this is the end of uh, this chapter. I wanted to mention that in one week from now, next Friday, we have the third exam. So therefore this class will be the last class that will count to the third exam and we will start a new chapter then in the next class.